Overdrive Podcast. All right. Welcome back to the podcast. This is episode 148. We have actually, we're kind of turning the pages and doing something a little bit different. Kind of, I guess we're back to the fishing world as... I don't know. We've done a couple. <laughs> we're, we're flipping the script. We're, we're going from early season deer back to uh, some salt water. I guess that's what you probably should do this time of year, right? Yeah. You got, I mean, what are we all doing right now? Yeah, you're planting, you're washing velvet, but in reality, you're, in the, you're out on the water. I mean, in all reality, I mean, how many, how many preseason deer hunting podcasts should you listen to this time of year? You got to break up the monotony with something different. <laughs> right you know be the dead horse type situation yeah well let's get this thing underway man this is your boy east coast trev and this is steve what's up man it's uh it's been a little crazy huh we haven't I, we did the john skinner one last you know <laughs> this one here and it's just been it's just been craziness it's that time of year i guess it's always that time of year for I, us. I thought about it today i was like wow we have not sat down and had a conversation other than like real quick two minute business calls since that episode it's just been like go 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 and and i mean it only gets busier for us from here on out right i mean it's just nuts yeah well you can still find us here <laughs> <laughs> we're always we're always here every single week i promise you that right <laughs> i hey you know what one of the good things is that we do have hunt stock coming up here on uh august 12th so we'll be together for that and be able to hang out and kind of I think it's always like, I think the shows fall in such great times because like we have a real busy time. We go to like a show or get together and then it breaks it up and then we go yeah, craziness we and then like, it like slows it down a little bit. Let it all go with the show, get it's, caught up, have our fun, make some stories. And then we're like, okay, we need a two, three month break. <laughs> yep, and then go back to doing what we're doing. Like <laughs> it just gets nuts that way, man. But no, I, I'm, I'm kind of excited to kind of like dive into the whole fishing aspect. I think it's, it, you know, it's been a long time coming. We've had some type of, po some fishing podcast before and kind of before we really tail right into like serious hunting podcasts to kind of break it up and have some good fishing content. Um, because we had Mike Iconelli, if you guys missed out on that one, that's a really good one, uh, to go back and listen to. It was a couple episodes, episodes ago, and then now having John Skinner. So kind of like you have two legends from and different parts of the world the fresh and you got the salt and you got the best of both worlds. That's right. I mean, it's, there's honestly nothing better than that. And, and John, John's a phenomenal, phenomenal, fluke fisherman and kind of what he's known for and surf casting for big stripers. But this, this episode, he, he kind of goes off the rail and it was into some new stuff. And he had just released a, a video. Um, and I'll let him tell the story obviously, but it was cool to kind of hear his perspective on, on that style of fishing, uh, something you really don't hear him talk about all that much. Right. It's just, it's kind of cool. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's definitely, when, when, it's, it's my world. <laughs> when you take a legend who has perfected one method and he can't quit raving about a new method, it, it's kind of a shock. It's, it's like, Hey guys, you should probably look at this. It's kind of funny because, you know, we had talked about, you know, that, that method. And then now, you know, it's like, it's like when you b buy a brand new car and you think that you're the only color car that's on the road. Right. And then after you get that car, you drive by 25, of the same color. Right. Yep. So after we had talked about, you know, the flutter style spoons, I'm on the water today and, and Seth's like, Hey dude, that dude's using a flutter spoon. That dude's using like constantly. We're like, dude, those they're everywhere. Like everybody's fishing with them. Like that's like the new thing. So I'm kind of excited to check them out to be honest with you. Yeah, it's a little wild, it's a little, but a little different. I, I mean, you couldn't have put it any more eloquently in as you did with the car because it is so true. You've never you, heard, you've never seen, and now all of a sudden it's everywhere. Overnight, it's everywhere, man. Everybody has them, and it, you know it's a, it's a good thing, honestly. And you know, as we had talked about, kind of in this podcast too, is that 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 area of fishing has been doing the same exact thing since the fifties. I mean, everybody fishes the same exact style every single day. I mean, every charter boat in the fleet fishes the same exact way. On this portion of the moon tide, they're fishing bucktails. And then they, then when the tide starts to slow down, then they diamond jig. Or, you know what I'm saying, you have some of your trolling guys. So, like, it's the same techniques all the time constantly. And nobody's really 
perfected or done anything new. Like, I mean, other than back in the day, they used to drill fish with herring and stuff like that, which is literally just a metal drill. And maybe, you know, Steve would probably understand this and maybe some of our older listeners remember the old, like, it looked like chain link. Um, uh, it's, it's like chain link chain that was in the toilets Yeah, and they would have, okay. It's literally that dude. It was a, it's like a seven or eight ounce sinker and it has a piece of that chain and then it's attached to a hook. And that's what they had used with a piece of herring. And they, that was a live bait rig. Like that's what they had used. And they really haven't modernized from that. I mean, they had that drail system and then they had gone to diamond jigs, which is no bait. And you're just fishing a diamond jig. So you're all the way down the bottom, 20 cranks up as fast as you can back down to the bottom. And then we three way, um, bucktails with a six inch. I mean, we had talked about that. Um, and they do it with eels also. And I mean, dude, that's pretty much it, honestly, in those areas. So to have something like this is, it's something definitely cool. And, and John goes, goes into perspective about it and kind of really tails it down. And if you guys haven't seen the YouTube, it's actually a pretty cool YouTube. I sat down and watched it and I was like, all right, this all makes kind of sense. So it's a good podcast, but you guys need to hear it from the horse's mouth and not from me. I get excited about it too much. Yeah, I, I think say, that's probably, I, why I know probably it looks ready. fun and I know you're excited because you're really like diving into it head first. Well, it's every day. And that's kind of, you know, it's, you know, you, you talk to me about it all the time. Like, bro, we should have more saltwater podcasts or we should have more fishing podcasts, but bro, I get too torn up in it. Like, it's like, th- if we had guests, I, I don't think that they would talk because I would, I wouldn't let them because I get so excited about it because knowing a lot about it. And it's a, something I don't really get to talk about. I just get to show 12 people a day, you know? So it's kind of, I don't know. We need to do more of them, though. I think there'll be a couple more things, and there's some new things coming in my world that we'll, we will then podcast about too. But I haven't even told Stephen yet, yeah. <laughs> so I'll Surprise. have to tell him. But <laughs> there's something new in my world. But we'll we'll talk about that later. You guys will hear trickles of it because it hasn't come to fruition yet. So, but screw it. Um, before we get carried away, why don't we, uh, I think we're past that point. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Hey, listen, dude, it's been a while. So I don't know what you want from me. (laughs) Hey man, you do you. Um, why don't we tear into the partners and the sponsors and, uh, get this thing on the road and get John on. Let's do it, dude. All right, man. Let's start it off with this. This show is presented by Huntworth, huntworthgear.com. If you guys haven't checked them out yet, you're missing out. Um, some of their casual gear. Uh, is phenomenal. They're good. Their lifestyle brands, their hats, it's just got a ton of really good stuff. And we kind of tore into it early season. If you guys haven't checked it out yet, probably are missing out on some of the best gear for 20% of the price of some of your high end gear. Uh, also, New Air Archery is the home of the Zeus broadhead, newairarchery.com. If you guys haven't checked those guys out, probably one of the sickest broadheads ever. And it, I keep saying that, but it's really the truth. That's why we stand behind these products. Until you've shot them and seen what they do physically, and it's you can't comprehend it. You cannot. You can't explain it. it you, you honestly really can't. Like everybody – we did a TikTok on it the other day and it's it's just mind blowing. It's mind blowing. Uh also Nor'easter Game Calls, Nor'easter Game Calls.com. We are working or uh, we <laughs> Mark <laughs> is working on the Jurassic series. Um they are being made as we speak. So and those are gonna go really quickly, guys. There's only gonna be a limited run of them, I think ten, maybe twelve. Um, they are probably the sickest grunt call that he's made domestic bands aluminite resin with um mammoth ivory so i had used them last year they are going to be very badass um grunt tubes so check those things out noristergamecalls.com also bowfishing magazine bowfishingmagazine.com for you bow fishermen out there um it's a great online magazine you can kind of thumb through it right online so go and check that out bowfishingmagazine.com also let me see. I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of screwed up here. Um, I think it's all the other ones. Oh, Latitude Latitude Outdoors. How can you forget about those guys? The Method Two and the Classic Two from Latitudes. And you know we're getting up to that saddle season. If you guys haven't, you know, got your your stand or your sticks or your platform or your, you know your saddle yet and you guys are new to this and messing around now's the time to go and check that out so check out those guys put those guys on your list for for a company and check out that's latitude 
outdoors.com. Also, um, There's one more. Can you remember? Who, oh man. Uh, I, I, I can't think of it. I just, I just <laughs> You've can't. You've been in the sun it? too long. That's why your head's sunburnt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can't forget Vital Grounds. That's right. Vital Ground Outdoors, man. Our good buddy Matt over there. And we just released a podcast with him. Um, we're partnered up with him now. All of your, you know, this, this is that time of year you should be buying these products. Your aiders, um, you know, some of your 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 rope mods or however you're going to hang your stands or sticks or, or platforms to the tree. You want to update, update some of your things on your saddle while well, your bridges, your lines, your linesman ropes, so on and so forth. Vital grounds is the place to be. Go and check them out. Vital grounds, outdoor.com. So cool. what do you think, buddy? We've been all over the map so far getting going in this one. Uh, I think we take this thing out to sea and just let it drift where it may. Let's do it, buddy. All right, here we go. All right, we're back on the phone with the man, the myth, the legend of the Long Island Sound, Mr. John Skinner. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for taking the time out of, you know, it is fishing season and things are really good and hot and heavy out there, so we don't want to take you away from all that too much. (laughs) That's right. I spent most of the day on the water today, so. (laughs) How was it? You know, I I got a lot of fluke. I probably had, you know, I had at least 40 fluke. Uh, four keepers, so I, you know, I, you know, I got my limit. That's a New York limit, uh, right? Four, four, nineteen. But yeah, it was a lot of work, you know. And uh, this was in the Sound Buoy Five um, off of Riverhead, so I, I know one of you guys is Connecticut, so you, yeah. you know where that is. Um, but yeah, you know, it's a shadow of what it used to be. And uh, and you know what, I, I wouldn't have had those fish without the trolling motor. And it seems like every single trip I'm making this spring, whether it's weak fish or it's fluke. I'm like on that trolling motor the whole time because, you know, the fluke fishing is tough and you need a perfect drift and the trolling motor can can do that for you. And, you know, when I went out, I had wind against current in the beginning and then the wind picked up and it was I, I needed to run a contour line. And the wind, if you, you know, if you didn't use the trolling motor, you just blew quickly across where the fish were. They were on the slope in 40 feet. But you would just blow right across it if you didn't, you know, use the trolling motor. The trolling motor, I could stay on it, and uh, that's that's how I caught. So yeah, that's very important, huh? I, so are you using some type of like spot lock or something to set a drift? Or uh, so I'm I'm just manually doing the drift. I mean, sometimes I'll put it on autopilot, and then I'll I always tweak the speed manually. I don't put it on cruise control because I want to adjust the speed to the feel of the rod and the, and the angle of the line, the bucktail, all of that. So I'm tweaking that speed manually. Um, I will often uh, set the, uh, set it on autopilot just for a direction. Mm -hmm. Um, But today this contour line is kind of curved. And at the time um, I just basically had to keep pushing myself into the wind a little bit to keep from blowing across the ledge as opposed to staying on the ledge, which is what I needed to do. Um, however, you, you mentioned spot lock. You know, I'm fishing by myself. I'll tell you what, when I'm fluke fishing, I and by myself, I use spot lock all the time. As soon as I hook up, I mean, I don't even mean when I catch a fish. As soon as I set the hook, I hit spot lock because I don't want to waste any of the drift. You know, I, I want to I, I pause the drift, get the fish in, deal with it, and then resume the drift. And so I use spot lock like crazy when I fluke fish by myself. That's crazy. Hey, let's, let's do one thing. Let's turn the key. Let's get this under, thing underway. For those that have been living under a rock in the sea, why don't you tell everybody who you are, where you're from and what you do, John? Um, yeah, the hardest part is what do I do? Um, yeah. So, <laughs> all right. So yeah, John Skinner, you know, I, I grew up on the North shore of Long Island, um, but I, a lot of time spent uh, surf casting the South shore of ocean beaches, um, inlets, all of that. And, uh, but you know, yeah, I do a fair amount of uh, boat and kayak fishing. I spend half my year now, uh, I retired from my day job a couple of years ago. So I spend six months of the year, uh, up here, the regular fishing season, you know, beginning of May till mid November. And then I go down to uh, Pine Island, Florida, which is Southwest Florida. It's uh, by Sanibel, Captiva in that area. And, um, and I, and I fish there. And the hardest part is that now there's no break. You know, usually when you're up in the North, you, you've got this, you know, five and a half month downtime, you get cleaned up, organized. Now there's no time. It's like, 
uh, I'm in Florida and then boom, um, it's the beginning of fishing season again. And then <laughs> it ends and I'm in, and it just around and around it, it goes, but, um, yeah. And what do I do? Yeah. So, all right. Yeah. Um, yeah. so I'm getting to be known as one of these influencers, you know, YouTube and all that. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a really excellent YouTube channel and, um, I would rather be known for my books because I have done, you know, I've written four books and I've been writing a long time and was doing that before there was a YouTube. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm probably best known for YouTube because you know, that gets into everybody's home and, uh, yeah. So very, very uh, John Skinner fishing is the name of the channel. Yeah. So it's kind of funny is that, uh, so one of the captains that I work with, I was like, Oh, we have John Skinner coming on the show on, uh, on Tuesday. And he's like, Oh, that's, that's like Mr. Rogers of the fishing world. Like just that <laughs> calm, cool, collective gentleman who goes through and just really, I mean, we, we think of you as, you know, the OG of, of the fishing world on YouTube. Well, I've, I've been called worse things than Mr. Rogers. So I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll take that. I'm happy with that one. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't yeah. mean to break it to you, but no, that's, that's fine. That's, that's fine. It's, I do. I, uh, yeah. I was very interested in what you were saying before, you know, I kind of took you away from it, but with that, with fishing that contour line and using a spot lock and stopping the drift in the middle, I think that's like, that's a really cool thing because you're not missing out on any of the other fish throughout the drift. Like when that's a normal right. person is out fishing, they're they're fishing 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 catch a fish now they're drifting now they're taking care of the fish and the drift and then now they've could have gone over some of the best parts of the fishing right well it's not only that i mean underwater my underwater videos that you know that's something that i've done for, for years and um i've got you know beautiful underwater fluke videos on my youtube channel shows that you know sometimes you've got multiple fish following you so you can imagine if you um, don't lose any ground, you know, the, I mean, basically they're following something. And then if you hook one of them, you bring it to the top. Well, what's the fluke going to do? Is he going to swim off? Well, maybe, or maybe he's not going to go anywhere. And uh, when you resume that drift, well, maybe it's still there. I, I got to tell you many times, as soon as I start that drift back up again, boom, in again. I mean, even today for a bit there, it was, you know, up, down, up, down, up, down, you know, and, uh, I think that's got something to do with it. But really, I started doing it just to not get knocked off my drift because the reason I'm using a trolling motor is I'm trying to work a tight line. So if I, like, uh, start unhooking or, you know, and bleeding a fish or doing whatever I'm doing, well, I'm, I'm going to get off it. So it's, it's uh, literally I set the hook, I hit the anchor button on the on the remote and, and, and anchor the boat. Now, now, when you say that you're – you're, what are you looking for to to – to even make your drift what are you looking for transition lines are you yeah. looking for what but kind of a lot you... of those you know so uh where i was today buoy five it's like an underwater it's like a you know a cliff down there it goes from at one point it goes from like 14 to 90 feet but where i was working it today uh you know it's still it's dropping very quickly what i was noticing was that um there were some bait balls and those bait balls were hanging around 40, 45 feet. First time I went through a bait ball, I, I, I got a keeper. So I started jiggling around a little bit, and that just seemed to be where I needed to, to be. And it's on the slope. You know, if I, you know, go one, one way, either direction in or out, I'm going to go deep in a hurry or I'm going to go shallow in a hurry. So just, you know, and that, you know, that was today. That's the way it was today. But uh, two weeks ago, there happened to be one spot there, you know, it was a much more subtle drop, but the, the fish were in one general area there, one tight Now, area. do you find as the season starts to progressively go on that you're moving into deeper water or shallower water? Well, or? what happens, unfortunately, so as the season goes on, like I so I start the season in Peconic Bay, and that has not been good the last couple of years. It's been quite poor. Mm -hmm. But suppose it had been good. Let's say it was good. Um, around now, around fourth by the fourth of July, usually you're about done in there, and then that's it for the summer. You're, you're finished, and you never get a you don't get any kind of a full run or anything like that. You know the fluke vacate that water gets warm. The fluke vacate the Baconics. It's done. Uh, in the sound, boy, you know June is often. Uh, you know, it used to be like mid May to about the fourth of July was good and then throughout the summer you had a lot of smaller fish 
and you could cull some keepers out of it. And yeah, you, you can try deeper. I've, I've never, f- I can never say that, Oh gee, it's, you know, the end of June, I'm going to go fish deep now. I, I've not seen that. You know, I basically like today, I, I had most of my fish in 17 feet, but the bigger ones came in 40. So you just kind of have to work it around a little bit and, and, and see what you can find. And you're just moving your, yourself progressively out and in, just trying to find where those fish are starting um, to hang out. I'm, I'm going to try like maps dip, or. Well, you know, I've got nice plotting software. I mean, first of all, I've fished the area a long time, so I've got right. old marks. But even when I'm not, I wasn't on old marks today. Um, but I've got um, the Humminbird Coastmaster, uh, the, you know, the good stuff on there. And so that that's very nice plotting software. And it's not even like it's an expensive unit. I mean, it's a, a Humminbird Helix. And, you know, so you've got a nice visual of, um, you know, what, what the contour lines look like. And actually where I was catching them today, even if you zoomed into like a hundred foot scale, the contour lines were so close together. It was like black on the screen. I mean, it was, you know, it was a really tight drop and that just happened to be where some better fish were. And, and even better wasn't great. You know, it was like the keepers were all 19 to 22 inches, you know, we're not talking seven pounders here, but right. The keepers. Yeah. And, and do you see now with, do you think that the regulations are where that they should be with the fluke and, <sighs> You think uh, that it's, I mean, what, what's your thoughts on all of that? Sounds like a rabbit hole to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, look, I, I've said for a long time, you know, fluke has been on a, a gradual slide for a long time. The, the best fluke fishing I saw was probably, you know, roughly in the, around 2010. If you want to see good fluke fishing, you go to my YouTube channel, you watch my first fishing videos that were posted in 2010. And it's me and my two kids, and we are bailing fluke plenty of five pounders. The limit w- was 21 inches to fish, and it's May 16th, so it's you know mid May. In fact, it's where I was today. It was buoy five. It was uh, in, in in the Sound, Roanoke uh, Riverhead, and uh, you know that was when fluke fishing to me was at its at its peak. Well, you know for the Sound, and and I know Peconic Bay was much better back then. And then it's just been sliding and sliding. And actually, this year seems like it's slightly better in the sound than it was the previous three. But, you know, it's it's horrid compared to what it used to be. And Conic Bay is horrible compared to what it used to be. And so what's causing it? I, I you know, I'm I, I don't know. Um, you know, and I never go after the commercial fishermen for anything. Right. I really just don't. But I have to question um about having them dragging on the spawning fish in the winter time because mm-hmm. i've seen pictures of that and you know the the fish that they get out there in the winter when they're on the spawning grounds and you know how 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 bright is it to be trawling spawning fish you know how does that make sense you know i, I just don't i don't get it but again um i'm not going to cast judgment there just I, I don't know what's what's doing it yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, and one of my things is, you know, one of the things that I've seen over the past couple of years is that, you know, we had started off where they had to be three miles from shore. Then it was one mile. Now that now they're allowing those. I mean, some of the beaches off of Rhode Island, those guys are a couple hundred feet from from the beach. Some wow. of the best fishing grounds. I mean. Yeah, no. I, well, I'm talking about guys that are, you know, I don't know whether they're 60, 70 miles off in the middle of winter, you know, right. or on the shelf. Uh, yeah, the the little, the, well, I call them little trawlers, you know, the right. local ones. Yeah, I, I don't know how, see, in New York, they have a pretty tight poundage limit, you know, and they might be allowed like, you know, 40 pounds a day or something. Jeez, if it's only 40 pounds a day, they might as well just go out and hook in line. I had 40 pounds today, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, right. you know, um, probably burn a lot less fuel and, you know be a little gentler on the bottom and everything else but uh yeah uh, yeah I, I don't know what they do up in rhode island or, or connecticut right. well we can just keep moving on and try and do our part as fishermen and and hope for the best right I yeah mean, we can only do what what we can control in our own yeah you gotta world. hope nature sorts it out too yeah absolutely i i kind of want to switch gears because before the podcast we were talking about plum gut and the sluice way and and those those areas and those are areas that in my opinion if you were to talk to some of the local fishermen from the connecticut shoreline they would talk about how some of those areas aren't what they used to be back (laughs) 
in the 2000s, right? <laughs> well, 2000s. No, it was like 90s? It was, ever, ever, ever. <laughs> you know, ever? Okay. yeah, okay. yeah. No, it's <laughs> no. I'm laughing because yeah, I used to do a lot of that. Uh, a couple of friends of mine had boats in Orient, and um, you know, I'm thinking back in you know in the 90s and stuff. And but you know, they had been doing it well before then, and. Um, yeah, like the Sluice Way might be the best example because that was the place for big bass. And I'm talking mm-hmm. about the 50s. My friends got a couple of 60s out of there. You know, that was the place. And, you know, he lives in Florida now, but in his final years here, he would go out there and catch nothing. You know, this guy, he was a pin hooker. So, you know, this right. is somebody, you know, he's a teacher. He had off all summer. He pounded the crap out of it, you know, so he knew it very well. And in the end, uh, there was like nothing there. And I don't even know that, you know, maybe somebody's fishing it there at night now these days, but I've not heard any, uh, you don't even hear sluice way anymore. No, I I think it's, it's kind of got wiped off the map more or less guys don't talk about it or fish. Right. And you know, it's funny. uh, I, I got to interview uh, Mike lap two years ago. Mm -hmm. I think you know who he is. And uh, absolutely. And um, he, it was his feeling that the next world record would come out of the sluice way, you know, and he's dove all over the place. And, mm-hmm. and he said, just from his observations, he said, that's the place, you know? And, and so now, yeah, like you said, it's been like, it's been wiped off the map, you know? And um, so one, so I, on a brighter note, yes, so sorry. From, I don't mean to go, no, 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 keep no, going no, negative. No, no, <laughs> well, no, you're, you're right. I mean, all this stuff, I mean, even before the slot, like a couple of years ago, you know, we would look at, you know, you see the pictures of, of what the party or the charter boats, the party boats were catching in Plum Gut, for example, and they're sitting there holding 28 inch fish. It wasn't, there was no slot at that point. You know, they, right. they would have been holding whatever it was they were catching. Um, but the fishing was so pathetic. They were happy to get keepers. So um, I've been out to the gut, you know, I, I've got it easy. I've got friends with nice boats. And when they say, Hey John, we're going to the gut. Well, the gut's nine miles from my house and their boats are less than a mile from my, so it's like I run to their boat, get on and 20 minutes later, I'm in the gut. So, you know, yeah, I'm going to do that. And I love bucktailing and stuff. So I I've gone there probably like four times in the last three weeks or so. Mm -hmm. Um, So the fishing there has been pretty good. Yes. And, and, um, I, and I hear the race is, is good as well. You know, phenomenal. So. The best in, in, since uh, the 2002, 2000, yeah. I mean, it, it's some of the best bass fishing this year is probably some of the best bass fishing we've seen. in yeah, I, I don't even know how long. Right. And they've seen that in the gut. And, um, so, so this is, this is good. This is a nice, nice to see something mm-hmm. tick up. Why did it happen? Well, you know, you can't, you can't really credit the slot. The slot just happened last year. The, uh, and I can't possibly have anything to, to do with that. And, uh, but it's certainly helping, uh, you know, on the big, it's nice to know all those big fish have to go back. That's a, mm-hmm. obviously a good, you know, that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, uh, it's good. Those to see breeding it. fish are, are around, you know, and the, the, the fish that we're seeing are very healthy, good fish. Yeah. I mean, you're averaging 34 inch fish in the race. I mean, it's, yeah. it's beautiful to see beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we should talk about what we were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I, all right. I, I really want to talk about and that. I'm because... excited about it. And so, yeah. And, you know, probably my viewers know that I'm a bucktail guy. I've got bucktails with my name on them. And, you know, and so I'm going to cost myself money by promoting something else. And I have nothing to do with this. Hey, if you guys haven't, I'm, I'm looking to see if it's showing up here. This mm-hmm. is a flutter spoon. And I'll tell you what, uh, up until about maybe six weeks ago i had no idea about these things this is a nine inch five ounce spoon um it's a tony maha spoon the ones that might be more uh common are the nickel spoons those are eight inches three and a half ounces so all right so anybody who's fished the gut and i i wish i had a three-way ready to go but i just don't um in, in I actually gut. did a, a three-way video not too long ago. Oh, great. So, yeah, you also, know, so. so in review there, you know, three-way, you've got your three-way swivel, a foot below that roughly, you've got a sinker that weighs generally 8 to 16 ounces, right? I don't know what you guys are using, but that's pretty yep. much where it is. And then you've got off of one of the other loops of the three-way, you've got 
about a five or six foot leader. I like using 80 pound test. It goes to a bucktail with a strip of pork rind. It's usually like an ounce and a quarter bucktail because it's the sinker that gets the rig down. The third loop of the three way goes to the main line. You drop that rig to the bottom, you take it up a crank or two and you hold it and you're drifting fast. These are, you know, whether it's the, the race or the gut, you're drifting, you know, three, four miles an hour over a lot of, uh, crazy bottom and you try to follow the bottom contour and not get hung up on the bottom. And, and this is a way that uh, commercial fishermen have made their living out there doing this. It's devastating method. Um, it is the method in the gut. I mean, either you're three weighing bucktails or you're three weighing eels, um, except on a slack current, then you probably don't have to three way the eel, but you still got to get it down there on some, some weight. So that f- the feature of that is those sinkers are heavy. Eight ounces is on the light end. I don't know about you guys, but, you know, usually eight-ounce sinker, that's about as light as you're going to go. I mean, yeah. you know, 10, 12, 14, 16. 20. Right. So, uh, yeah, 20. Um, so I use cannonballs, by the way, and it, it allows me to cut back on the weight. So instead of a 20-ounce a bank, a 16-ounce cannonball will do the same thing. So And it gets hung less because it's round. It kind of right. doesn't get wedged. So anyway, that's a side thing. So, you know, with, with that in mind, um, when I was on a boat about 10 days ago, this is all pretty recent now, and somebody th- said they're going to drop this spoon to the bottom of the gut in, it was about, we were in about 80 feet of water. I said to him, I said, that's stupid. <laughs> and then he proceeded to get it to the bottom. And I was like, okay. And then he hooked a couple of fish with it. Unfortunately, the only thing he brought up was a blue fish. He had it something break them off. And so we never got to see any of the fish. Um, but I was impressed that he he got he got the spoon down. So um, he had one thing led to another. And uh, he, he came to my house and I came to possession of these big spoons. And a couple days, actually two days after that, um, I got out with some friends of mine that I usually fluke fish with, but since the fluking wasn't so great, we went bass fishing. It's nice and close to where we live. Um, so these guys know how to three way bucktail. And, um, we had four guys in the boat. One guy stayed on the wheel the whole time. And the other two guys, you know, went down with the bucktails like they normally would. And, I decided to go ahead and drop the big, drop the big spoon down. And I have to tell you on the first drift, cause it's my first drop. I I'm clueless. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I dropped it down on, on 30 pound braid, 80 pound leader. Um, I really had trouble detecting, like I did not detect bottom. I don't, uh, didn't have, a, I had no idea where the damn spoon was. And I actually thought to myself, Cause my friend next to me, boom, he hooks up right away with the three way. And I'm like, all right, I took a few cranks to reel it in and I got hit and I laughed. I said, Oh, you're not gonna believe it. I just actually got hit on this thing. And in the middle of that sentence, boom, I got clobbered and the fish was about 25 pounds, which was much bigger than what, you know, like one of the guys he'd been out there probably five times in the previous two weeks. He goes, Oh, he goes, we're not getting any, anything this big. He said, we're getting slots. The slots are, 28 to 35 inches we don't we didn't have anything over slot so all right so i was first drift so now i'm obligated to try the spoon on the second drift right well second drift uh, i got one that was like probably just over slot so it wasn't you know it was probably you know a 20 pounder and then the next the next four fish were probably 25 to 30 pounds and i mean we're i'm not exaggerating here and the guys on the boat are not getting them they're not getting them with the bucktails. The guy running the boat said, you know, he goes, I'm watching the guys around the other boats. He said, they're not doing what you're doing. I, I couldn't look up. I was busy the whole time. Right. If if you think I'm exaggerating, that video just posted on my YouTube channel um, at 6 p.m. this evening. So um, you can see exactly what happened. You can hear the amazement in my voice. You can hear a lot of holy craps and holy, you know, and yeah. what the, and uh, because, it, because it's like, you know, as we we're going up drift, the one guy saying to me, if you told me that you were going to be able to get that spoon to the bottom of the, because we were starting out just in 95 mm-hmm. feet of water, hundred feet sometimes, he said, if you were to tell me that you're going to get that spoon to the bottom, I would say there is no possibility of you doing that. Now, the only thing we can figure, and worse than that, is when you drop it in and you look at it, sometimes it just flutters. So it's like not even going down. But I think what happens is it somehow it gets going. And when it gets going, 
it goes and it gets down. Are and, you staying uh, direct contact with it the whole time? Uh, well, I'm in contact with it. The, the, the challenge I found was detecting bottom. So okay. because it's a very inconsistent drop, you know, it will get going and it's going. And then all of a sudden it decides it's going to flutter. Now, if it does that halfway down, well, then, you know, hey, I'm not on the bottom yet. You know, it's the flutter. Right. You, you just wait a second. It'll get going again. But if it does it near the bottom, what I was finding is, all right, just give it a little bit. Make sure you see that line go slack and you know you're at bottom. That's now, as now, here's the crazy thing. I'm sure, as you know, fish in the gut. If you go dragging the bottom in the gut, what's going to happen? You're losing your gear, right? It's over. So that trip, and, and I had a lot of fish, and I had a lot of nice fish. I did not lose any spoons. I hung bottom four times. Twice, I immediately just grabbed it. And this was only 30-pound braid, but I grabbed it and just pulled up real sharp, and I got it off. Now, there were two times where um, we had enough room where we ran up current with the boat, and, you know, and, and pull the spoon out by going up current and getting up drift. Both of those times, I pulled other people's rigs off the bottom. You know, I was hooking lines and stuff that are laying down there. Um, but my point is, I didn't, it's not that I got hung up in rock. It's that I, I snagged line that was down there. So I lost um, no spoons to, you know, uh, on that trip. So, yeah, so the, the next trip was actually two days later. By then, I had a couple of Nichols spoons. Those are the eight-inch, three-and-a-half ounces. And um, so I tried on that trip four different spoons, three different colors, two different manufacturers. They all caught. And, wow. and the best fish I had that trip was 40 pounds. Now, Jeez. this is 1030 in the morning. You know, uh, uh, this this was last week, and you know I'll I'll post that video. Uh, you know, in another two weeks, I've got I'm a little backed up on video now, but you know I I've got that on video. I had my 60 pound boga on the boat, and uh, you know we did weigh that because we didn't have a boga the first time. Mm -hmm. you know, we had nice fish, so I, I brought it with me. Um, the second one, which was good because I, I had that that big one. Um, but yeah, 40. It was it was just a tad over 40 pounds. Um, Great old moon tides. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, middle of the day. Oh, and the best part is all that fishing is done with my, the, and uh, I'm not self-promoting here. It's the John Skinner fluke rod, the dark matter Skinner fluke rod. That's what I'm using. That rod is very strange that it's able to handle, because I three-way with that as well. And mm -hmm. I, don't, I didn't obviously design it for any of that. It's made for bucktailing fluke with 10 to 15 pound line, which it does incredibly well. It, the problem with that is we can't keep it in stock, but I'll tell you, it, um, it was great in the gut. It's a beautiful, it turns out to be, I'd never even used one of these spoons when I designed the rod turns out to be by luck, a great spoon rod. It's got that flex in the middle because what you do when you, oh, so when you drop it, down, yeah, I want to see, I want to hear about the yeah, technique. Right. So, yeah. Of yeah, course. When you, when you hit bottom, you, you take it. In fact, what I do with that rod is I put my hand down on the, the bottom grip and you, you lift it and then you let it flutter. And then you lift it and you let it flutter and you got to watch the line, you know, because as you're going up the slope, you know, you're drifting fast, mm -hmm. you're going, starting 95 feet, going up to 50. If you see it hit, then I'll take a crank. So I don't want to drag bottom and get snagged. If I take a few of these and I don't see it hit, then I'll hit the clutch and, and drop a little line just to see the slack so I know I hit bottom. I don't know why it doesn't snag more. You know, I, I don't know whether there's something about the, the shape of this. Mm -hmm. To me, how on earth, you know, it's a treble hook. How do you right. get away with, dra with landing a treble hook at the bottom of the gut and not get hung up? But it doesn't. I, it's like the Rocky Mountains down there. <laughs> well, and plus there's just so much junk down there. Yeah, you know, that's hundred years of fishery. Yeah, so uh, so yeah, that it, it's the most. If you watch the video, you'll just see, you, you'll just hear the amazement. And like I said, um, you know, I I make money on bucktails, and <laughs> I'm losing money telling you about these things. But it's it's you know really quite remarkable that. Um, and, and you know what? I know that they uh, use them in like Raritan Bay. They use them in a lot of places where mm -hmm. it's easy to use them. It's 20, 30 feet. You know, the current's not running at 
you know, three or four knots. And in fact, you know what, when we got the 40 pounder, yeah, that day the current was, you know, we were four mile an hour drift. Uh, it, it gets down and, and it, it, it catches and not just that one. Like I said, I use the nickel spoon. In fact, the nickels, uh, the 40 was on the nickels. Uh, and I use gold. I use chartreuse. I use, it didn't matter. Whatever. I, it's just those, it's a big f- target. It gets their attention and it just gets completely out of the ordinary size. Cause like I said, normally we've been bucktailing slots in there. Mm-hmm. And that's crazy because that, that, those areas, I mean, I, I don't know about the gut. I haven't been there this year yet, just yet, but, um, it like the race, the race has small herring in it, butterfish. There was some Atlantic, uh, mackerel in there. So wow. there's a whole salute of just different, you know, species of fish bait that's in there. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it, it's mind boggling that something like that would work. I well, couldn't imagine. But those, but those are, but those are big baits and here you go. Yeah. You know, adult bunker. In fact, you know what I, I, what I said when, when the trip was going on, I said, I feel like I'm, it's like, it's like fishing live bunker. That's because, you know, mm-hmm. if you were to drop live bunker down, yeah, you would get bigger fish most likely than the guys bucktailing during the day. And I felt like that's what I was doing. You know, I was catching, I was catching fish that were generally reserved for the live bait guys. You know, it's, just, it's like fishing the sluice way with hickory shad, like we yeah, used so, to do yeah. back in the day, right? There you go. <laughs> oh, I bet that would be good. <laughs> That's yeah. insane, right? Uh, yeah, no, I think it's really cool. And I, like when the flutter, they had a similar spoon that came out. Guys would fluke fish with on yeah, a three way. Yeah, right. I no I, and I never, I well, never, I never, I, I, I got so. Or, yeah, I've seen it used. I've not been impressed. Now, the reason why is because, to me, you need to have the right conditions for that spoon to behave. You know, whereas now this flutter spoon is different because all you need to do is hit bottom. And, right. and then you got it because even if it scopes out, you know, you just give it a big whip. And if it comes up, it just flutters to the bottom you know it, it just right. does its thing the fluke spoon thing yeah i'm, I'm sh- look you can catch fluke on on many different things and certainly a properly presented spoon is going to work the trick is you know you go out to montauk and you've got the wind against the current and even if you correct with a trolling motor you're going to have the bottom current moving at a different speed that it, you've got so many complex variables going on that it it makes it difficult where's a, a bucktail and i always said this in terms of surf casting the bucktail's always working you can throw the bucktail in the most turbulent surf like a washing machine but a bucktail's always making a good presentation of itself so it gives you that little bit extra i don't know margin of error for presentation because they just you know they just work doesn't it's not comp it's not a complicated lure so so and and for those guys that are out there, I mean, like that that is your lure, your go to lure when it comes to fluke fishing is is obviously the bucktail. Yeah, and, and it's not just you know that. I mean, I, I well, I mean striper everything. You know, I mean it's right. it's my go to lure. Period. That's why I was so shocked by the spoon because if, if you would have told me, you know, even a week before that that yeah you're gonna go to the gut and not use a bucktail, I'd be like, well, no. Nah. <laughs> I'm not going. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess I didn't go. Out of your mind. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so when it comes to uh, comes to fluke fishing, now what is what is like your go to setup for while you're fluke fishing? For those that maybe not know, I, we have a lot of Midwesterners listeners and stuff like that. Um, so, wh- what 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 is your go to setup on fluke fishing? All right, so um, basically. Uh, I mean, always like 15 pound braids. Some of my friends use 10, even at Montauk. I like to go a touch heavier. So it's what is really important that is that you use um, something no thicker than 15 because, uh, you know, you need to be able to get down through the, the current, the depth, everything else, you know, to present a reasonably weight bucktail. So, all right, so I use 15 pound braid. You go down to uh, then a 30 pound leader we're at the bottom you have a surgeon's loop that's where you attach the bucktail one foot above that you have a dropper loop that's where you attach the dropper and that can be like i like the tsunami silicone skirt teasers uh, in the sound i actually just use a bare 
uh, Gamakatsu bait holder hook and uh, just put a gulp grub on that. Uh, both the bucktail and the teaser, whatever it is, is tipped with a gulp grub. Um, if it's like big water, like Montauk, Block, any of that, you know, ocean stuff, even Peconic Bay, I use the six inch grubs. In the sound, I use the four inch grubs. And, wow. But the big thing is, motion in the strike zone is everything i've got the underwater video to prove that a bouncing gulp rig attracts the fish while they just swim right by a fresh strip of of meat they go right by it they go right to the motion it's like a magnet so it's motion in the strike zone i i've never i would at first i was never really a believer of the gulp baits because I've never really used them when they had first come out, right? And then you start to use them, and you're like, well, you don't even need bait anymore. Right. Because well, like, yeah, that's like, a, you know, like, bait many years for that. It, yeah. it doesn't even make sense because, you know, like I would use a, I use a double bucktail rig, and, you know, same thing as you uh, just have a small bucktail up, maybe a half ounce, and then, you know, your bigger bucktail on the bottom. And we, I would just take, uh, you know, uh, just like a curly tail or whatever and put a strip of – um a squid on it and fish that way. And then I started using gulps and then you don't, you don't even need bait. You don't need nothing. Well, you just it, fish it, the gulp. It's, it's better or worse than that. In that the, um, the squid is actually counterproductive at Montauk because it, it attracts every stupid sea bass in, yes. on the planet. And you know, you can't catch big fluke when you're pulling up short sea bass the whole time. And there's That's a true. lot of sea bass down there. I've got some video uh, that I recorded there where there's like clouds of those things and you know the squid they're just all over it um fortunately they're not as as bad with the gulp sometimes they're bad with the gulp too but not as bad as squid or the porgies or the sea robins or everything oh, else yeah. which sometimes the gulps kind of keep them away well the gulp doesn't keep the sea robin nothing keeps those things away <laughs> yeah yeah have you ever eaten a sea robin before though, I, I you know one time i i did try it and i just thought it was bleh you know, it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't fishy. It was just not, I don't know. I, I remember not being impressed. Um, right. You know, you always hear people, oh, it's really good. You know what? If it was really good, why isn't there a commercial market for them? You know, you would think, you know, why is there a commercial market for bluefish, but not sea robins? How can, if somebody said to me, <laughs> hey, for dinner tonight, you can have sea robin or you can have bluefish. Well, that's an easy one, right? You know, right. I'm going to have, have bluefish. I'm going to have sea robin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm having sea robin. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll take my chances. Yeah, yeah. It, it's I, I, I've had it before, and we did like a a, a coconut panko, and it was it was phenomenal. Oh, I, okay. I don't know. I liked it. I yeah. don't, it's got like the consistency of like catfish. You know, it's a good. It's a. It's all right. You know, I mean, I guess it's whatever you dress it up with. It's like bluefish. If you dress it up good enough, you know, put lipstick on it. Yeah, it's, it's you know it. It is what it is. Yeah. The last step of any bluefish recipe is open garbage can put in, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I, I did have one time when I was a kid, a, a neighbor made bluefish. And, I mean, I remember it to this day. I was probably, you know, 15 years old, and I still remember <laughs> eating that. I still remember that meal because it was bluefish and it was good. Yeah. <laughs> we make really... a pate with them. They're not bad pate like yeah, great smoke. smoke them and pe- oh, yeah, smoke, smoke them and then make and then make a pate but i'm not you know we get a lot of customers on the boat and it i, I wouldn't I, they're like how is it is it good they're like i heard you put it in milk and i said anything that you have to go above and beyond and do for two days it's probably not worth eating right i mean it's yeah, not like a yeah. fluke filet you know you yeah. take a fluke filet and you can do just about anything with it and it yeah. tastes amazing yeah absolutely know? yeah what is your one of your favorite recipes for fluke it's pretty lame, but it's really good. It's probably not very healthy. Um, if you take complete pancake batter, you know, so you just have to mm-hmm. add water and you just run the fillets through that pancake batter and you um, fry it in peanut oil. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's really good in my language. Yeah, no, it's yeah. really <laughs> anything yeah. in peanut oil is good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's got a high smoke point, so it's just a good frying oil. And uh, yeah, it's um, yeah. That's probably your favorite. Well, I got to tell you another one. You know, the problem is it's my wife's favorite. She basically doesn't. She basically just isn't happy if I make it any other way. But if she's like not around, (laughs) what I'll do, if it's from if it's just for me, then what I'm going to do, it's going to be salt and pepper, run it through flour and then just put that in in a pan with butter. Just, you know, do that in butter. And whoa. Yeah. 
That's really great. It's you easy. must eat, eat plenty of it then. Uh, yeah. Catch them all the yeah. time, right? Yeah. And you see the problem, well, not it's not a problem, but the problem now is, you know, I used to freeze them, you know, for the winter, you know? Mm-hmm. So, but now, I mean, I'm not going to go take fluke fillets to Florida. So basically, you know, if, if I'm into, I, I just don't take a lot of them. Like right. when, when I go out with my friends, I, I just take, you know, enough for a meal or something. Even today, you know, I, I had my limit. And then, you know, my friend who takes me fishing and his house is on the water. So he's got a nice cleaning table. It's like, Hey Rick, I'm going to go use your cleaning table. And then I, you know, I give him some fish. So I don't have right. it because I don't want to freeze it. Well, I have to say it does. I freeze is great. And earlier this year when I had a limit, I, I did um, freeze a couple and then it was good. Cause you know, this week uh, my daughter was in town and then, you know, we like to eat fish. So I was able to, you know, have fish, even though I didn't have any fresh stuff around. So it was, it was still good. Yeah. That is one of the great things about fish is, you know, not a lot of people get it. So, so when you do have it, you always make a dish with it. Like when Steven comes up, we make thresher shark and whatever else, any type of fish that we catch, we just yeah. try and share it with everybody. It's kind of a, a good camaraderie meal for oh, everybody. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's always a great thing. One, one thing, question I do have for you, John is what, was there some type of learning curve when you went from new England fishing to Florida fishing? Was there a big difference for you or <laughs> some, uh, yeah. Um, so the, yeah, I'm laughing because it's, um, maybe I'm a little frustrated that I probably did better. So I've only been down there now two and a half winters. So there was the first half of winter and then there was, um, the winter of, I guess that's 2020 and then 2021. So I actually did, I was more productive actually in 2020 than 2021. And it has to do, Oh, so, and, and the complication is that the waters are very shallow. So I fish a lot of water. That's, two feet or less that's very common and those water i mean and i was going to say three feet but as i thought about it there's not too many spots that are three feet but everything is less than you know i'm fishing everything is less than three feet almost um a few exceptions to that but what happens is a couple of things with that shallow water is is temperature is one of them um you know we do get some cold days in florida not a lot but there are days you wake up and it's 45 degrees out well if you think about snook snook start dying below 59 degree water now what happens is the the water on the flats in the winter time is generally like around 70 degrees low 70s depends on the weather but that's the thing is that there can be wild temperature swings of that water and you have to you know the fish are going to react to that and they don't all react the same the snook are actually kind of predictable which is a, a something i've learned to exploit when we get those cold fronts they in order to survive they've got to go to deeper water so, and, and the deeper water is not like it is here where you go offshore and, you know, go to a hundred feet or something. Um, mm-hmm. Deeper water there is you swim up canals and, and things like that. You know, you go basically inland. A lot of those canals are deeper. I mean, if the outside waters are only two or three feet, but the canals are 12 feet, well, that's deep, you know, deep water. So they have to go there. And um, so I've been able to capitalize on that. Now what happens is if you get a couple of cold days in a row, but now suddenly the sun comes out, um, the deeper water lags, the, the, I mean, the shallows where it's, it's shallow and muddy, the sun comes out, beats on that for a few hours, <clears throat> excuse me, that Florida sun, that water is going to warm up. Well, then those fish are going to head out to that water. So being able to anticipate where especially snook where they're going to go based on temperature is, is huge. And um, so that's one part. The other part is with the shallow water, the wind blows it around and it blows it out and it blows it in. And like where I am, if you've got uh, North or East or Northeast winds, any of that, if you have like, you know, 20 mile an hour wind, you could lose a foot of water. Now think about it. If you're only fishing two feet of water, and you happen to be on the part of the moon phase where you're running a negative tide, negative tide meaning, um, well, first of all, our tides are tiny. Like the the tidal swing is probably two feet in total. So if you're on a moon phase and you're already running close to a foot below normal and then the wind blows a foot out, well, guess what? The two foot flat, which is actually 
a fair amount of water. I mean, you could go running across that 40 miles an hour in your flat spot, no problem. And, you know, it's actually too deep even for tailing redfish. That's going to be mud. There's going to be no water. So learning how how that all works is tough. And the other part is the wind moves the water in terms of current. And I've, you know, I've had to learn this the hard way. Hey, I'm going to go out and I'm going to fish, uh, you know, uh, the outgoing water. Well, guess what? I go out and the wind's blowing against that current. So there is no current, you know, it's, it's, it's not, Oh, and we're used to tides that every six hours up and down, up and down, very regular. I don't know if you realize, but in the Gulf, it's, it doesn't work that way. We have days where we have 17 hour incoming tides, 17 hours. And what? it happens what ha- it happens on the quarter moons. And then we get times where I have to look at, I can't look at just what time is high tide, what time is low. I have to look at plots because there are also days where the tide will come in for a while. Or no, tide will, will, will come in, it will come up. And then it will level off for three hours and do nothing, and then it will it will continue going up again. That's a tide, Jeez. you know. But but wow. then, but then there's days where it starts at two in the morning, it starts coming in, and it doesn't get done till seven at night, you know, whatever it is. Now, I mean, yes, literally seventeen hour incoming tides. Yeah, you, you don't have you don't have the normal, like like we're used to. Yeah. So and does that yeah. affect the fishing? Huh. Oh. So when when you have the tide coming up and then you get a flat spot, don't even bother fishing a flat spot. You, you will not catch. It's, you know, not any of the good fish, you know. I mean, it's like anything. You, know, you don't fish for striped bass with no current, right? Well, right. you know, whether it's snook and, and redfish or it's striped bass and weak fish, current. You know, there are, there are universals to fishing. Um, so that's the good thing. I'm, I'm a halfway decent southern fisherman only because i'm a good striper fisherman and when i got there and i didn't you know didn't know anything i i could go out and go okay i think there's going to be current on that point uh what are those what are those birds doing over there you know it's all the you know uh structure current bait you know the same things we look for in striper fishing that's all important down there as well that's crazy. You would think that it would almost be a good thing, right? A 16-hour, 17-hour tide huh. that no, you can fish in a whole no, entire ebb. Because, you know, like if the fishing's better yeah, on well, an ebb tide. Or yeah, Here's the, the downside of that is in 17 hours, it probably only moved 18 inches vertically. That's why. There's, it's very it's really weak. not doing anything. It's very weak current. Yeah. You know, uh, maybe it's, I have to look. Maybe maybe it moved two feet in uh in 17 hours but it, wow. it was it was a weak current i i don't do well on those 17 hour incomings so yeah that's gotta be that's gotta I, I couldn't i couldn't even i couldn't even fathom honestly having to readjust to something like that because your mind is so set especially you know bass fishing or fluke fishing like you have six hours if you do better in one area on the ebb tide you know and then this happened you know what I, that would mess me i would yeah, would, well, oh. like I said, I you know you you learn your lessons. You learn. For you know what helped me a lot was um, uh, I. So we have a a place on a canal, but we didn't have a dock the first year. And if I didn't have a dock, I wasn't getting a boat because I'm not going to go trailering. So I was I don't want to say stuck, but I was stuck with my Hobie. That's all I had, and that was the best thing that ever could have happened to me gonna say, in my opinion that's not a bad thing it, no 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 it, <laughs> i love especially, kayak fishing right right so i if you look at my florida videos you'll see you know 80 percent of them are probably kayak and so being forced to fish out of the kayak that first winter was just spectacular because first of all uh, i didn't have to worry about getting stuck in low water you know and i could go into any kind of low water and i learned about you know not spooking fish because you know the kayak doesn't do that and um you know so that that's but it also you know if i had a boat in the backyard i would go only what the range of that boat was where the kayak you, know, you take that anywhere any place you have launching ramps so it enabled me to you know, try some other places, you know, even if it's only 10 miles or, you know, 17 miles or 20 miles away, uh, I wouldn't be likely to go with the boat only because I have to pass up so many other places. You know, I I go where the access is with the kayak and um, the kayak fishing really has helped me a tremendous amount. 
That's awesome. John, if you had one fish that you could fish for for the rest of your life, no matter what, what would it be? It's it's hard not to say tarpon. Now, I don't know if, yeah, it's hard not to say tarpon, but you hook those things and there, there you have, you know, six feet of silver up in the air, you know, uh, you know, six feet up in the air, even it's just, it's unbelievable. You know, the, the rush when you hook those things. Now, I don't know that it ever, I can't see how that ever gets old. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. So that, that's, you know, but it, it, you know, it could be only because, you know, maybe in my entire life, I probably landed, you know, 15 of them or something, whatever mm-hmm. it is. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a hard fish to beat. It really is. That's awesome. John, I got one last question as we start to wind down here and we ask everybody, this is, is what drives you outdoors? What drives me outdoors? Hmm. Boy, you know, I'll tell you what learning, learning stuff to me is like the, one of the more exciting things. If, if you, I'm not trying to plug that video nope. that went up at six o'clock, but right. if you hear, <laughs> excited hear, about it, but if you heard <laughs> if the, the excite, you know, you can hear the excitement now because yeah. who would think after all right, you do that kind of fishing. Who would think after all these years, you know, with everything, you know, refined for fishing the gut, the race, mm-hmm. how could something so drastically different come along and just bury those traditional techniques? I mean, those guys, the other guys on the boat, they, they got like nothing while I crushed fish that were much bigger than what is being caught. On a, on a lure I had never even seen until a few weeks earlier. No idea it, what I'm doing. No, it, that's a great that's a great plug for lures. If you don't know what you're doing and you're brand new to it and you do well, <laughs> it must be a pretty damn good lure. Right. Fair point. <laughs> it's, it's crazy because, you know, I think that people are afraid to go out of the norm, right? For us, we fish the race, plum gut. I, it, it is it's that one technique that has been going on for centuries and, (laughs) and literally that's what everybody does. And if you try to go out the norm, if you're not diamond jigging three weighing or, you know, trolling, you're not doing anything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, No, that's why this was, uh, and and, you know, I'm, I was fishing with guys that are like 70 years old and been fishing out there for decades. (laughs) Right. And you know, (laughs) and, uh, yeah, yeah. It was just, it was uh, really an eye opener. It's, you know, I'm on the surf casting and I just can't help. I'm thinking like, what are we not thinking of? You know, mm-hmm. that's what, what, what am I missing? First of all, I, I haven't tried yet because this all just happened, but you can bet I'm going to try and cast one of those three and a half ounce spoons. That's no problem. I want to see how it's probably going to cast like a license plate is what it's going to do. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, assuming it doesn't. Um, yeah. Yeah. T-Man, T-Man tubes came out with a, a casting spoon similar to that. And it was, it was a pretty effective tool at one uh-huh. time. Um, <clears throat> there's been a couple of them that have gone out and, you know, they work because they get to see something different. Like in the surf world, the dock was one of the, those big spooks that yeah. were, you know, nine to 10 inches yep. it was like, kind of like right now is the end all be all in top water fishing. And there's a lot of, you know, well, actually, um, Hedden came out with it originally in the wooden, right. but they ended up discontinuing it. But when they do come out with something like that, it's something that those fish has never seen. And it's a very effective tool until something else then now comes out. <laughs> yeah. But, but they are, a lot of these things are ageless, you know, but mm-hmm. it was just so you know surprising that, you know, something, uh, because this is, it's drastically different. I mean, yeah, I, I realize spoons have been around forever, but not, not, you know, nine inches and five ounces, you know, it's, uh, especially, you know, I think, I think the most important point to this whole entire thing, honestly, John is to be able to fish those areas with something like that. That is not, that's, that's unheard of. Yeah. It made no sense. I, I, even the whole time I was doing it, it was how, how could this possibly be working? You know, but it, <laughs> well, it, it certainly it, did to me. This is kind of like proof that you can teach an old salty dog a new trick. <laughs> that's what I've taken away from this. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Well, John, we appreciate you. And before we let you go, go ahead and let everybody know where they can find you, your YouTube channels, your social media, all of that. 
Yeah, just uh, my YouTube channel, John Skinner Fishing. Um, that's uh, I, I do have. Uh, yeah, if you watch any of my videos there, then you'll see I've got uh, courses um, over at Salt Strong. So it's saltstrong.com slash Skinner. And, of course, my books, which I'm most proud of. And you can find if you just Google John Skinner Fishing Books on Amazon, you'll, you'll find those as well. Outstanding. Well, you guys have really got a very top-level taste of what it is John does. And I dare say he's pretty dang good at what he does. So... If you have questions, if you have interest, go over, check out his channel. It will be linked above. And uh, until then, guys, John, thanks for joining us. And thanks for taking the ride right here on the Outdoor Drive.